Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so very much this morning for the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord, gathered together as the body of Christ. Father, we pray for those this morning who want to be here, but they can't because they are sick, and some of them sick with with the COVID virus. And so, Lord, we pray right now for their healing, that you would touch their body, that you would heal their bodies, that you would strengthen them, that you would grant them an extra measure of grace. And so, Father, we pray that you would separate this virus from them as far as the east is from the west. And, Father, our trust is always in you, for you are the great physician who heals. But we are thankful that you use modern medicine, Father. So we, whether someone takes the virus or takes the, takes the, uh, uh, the shot or not, that's up to them. That's up to their own conscious, conscience. But Lord, we thank you for it. Lord, I also pray for those who aren't sick, but they are at high risk. And they want to be here, but Lord, uh, they just don't feel comfortable getting out. God, we pray that when they do feel comfortable, that they'll be here with us. Until then, we pray for them and pray that they would be blessed through the preaching of your word as they watch through live stream. And Father, we also pray for those who need to be here. Those who are running around everywhere. They're going to Walmart. They're going to the mall. But for some reason, they just think they can't come to church. God, we pray that you would convict them of hypocrisy, that you would bring them to repentance and that they would understand the importance of gathering together with the body of Christ. You have told us in your word that we are not to forsake the coming together. The book of Acts, the church met on the first day of the week, every week. Many people haven't been to church in a long time And it's not because of the COVID virus. It's because of indifference. So may you convict them of their indifference. And help them to realize that they're a part of the body of Christ. They are not the head. Christ is the head. And their wills are to be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. Father, we pray for those who are lost. That you would bring them to the saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior, the King of glory, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that you'd bless the preaching of the word now. For your glory and your glory alone do we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 2. As we're going to be out of the book of Revelation just for a little while. We'll get back there soon. But we're going to celebrate the season. And uh, I don't know who decorated our auditorium, but it looks great, doesn't it? So whoever you are, thank you. Appreciate that. Amen. Appreciate that very much. Also, don't forget about our candlelight service. We're thinking about you, aren't we? We're going to give you two services. We're going to give you a mask-required service. Because we want everybody to be able to come who wants to come. And then we're going to give you a mask optional service. So make sure that you make that a priority to be here. And I have no doubt that those of you who are here today will. (laughs) All right. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. The title of this morning's message is Wise Men and Fools. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king... Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, the land of Judah, 
are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. From you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until they came, before it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. That's what Jesus does. Amen. <laughs> Puts a joy in your heart. Verse 11, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down. Notice that. We sang about that a few moments ago, ago, didn't we? Adore him. Adore him. Let us bow down before him. And they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening the treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country another way. I want to do something just for a moment. I want to talk to you just just briefly at the beginning of this message about the importance of biblical theology. And what I mean by that is understanding how the Old Testament informs us in the New Testament. How it's one redemptive story. And how the things in the Old Testament foreshadow what would take place in the New Testament. That's why I believe if you truly want to have a great appreciation for the New Testament, especially for the atonement, you have to study the Old Testament. For example, just like the wicked Pharaoh in Exodus, who unsuccessfully attempted to murder all the male Israelite newborns, Herod is unsuccessful in attempting to kill Jesus, a greater Moses. The typological parallel between Moses and Jesus in the birth narrative should not be forgotten. The book of Exodus, think about that, the book of Exodus begins with the birth narrative in which God displays His sovereign hand uh, or provision to His servant who will later mediate God's covenant to the Israelites. By juxtaposing the birth of Jesus and the birth of Moses, Matthew sets the stage for the bulk of Jesus' ministry. Like Moses, Jesus will bring his people out of slavery, sin. He will lead them to a new mountain, Jesus himself. He will mediate to them a new covenant, Jesus' teachings. So that they may dwell with God in a new promised land, the new creation. I wanted you to see this from a biblical theological uh, perspective so that we may gain a greater appreciation of the birth of Jesus. That Jesus indeed is the greater Moses who's leading his people out of slavery. And just as Pharaoh attempted to kill Moses, so Herod here attempts to kill Moses. Jesus. Look at verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he became furious and sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old and or under. But what happened to Jesus? His father fled to where? To Egypt. So when we look at the birth narrative of Moses in the book of Exodus, it ought to remind us of the birth of Jesus, the greater Moses. I think one would have to be a fool, don't you believe, to to, uh, fail to understand the significance of the incarnation? Or to put it more simply, one would have to be a fool to fail to understand the importance of Jesus' birth. I want to talk to you this morning about three kinds of people. Three kinds of people. First of all, there are those who are hostile to Jesus. We're going to study that this morning. 
Then there are those who are indifferent to Jesus. And then we will see that there are some who actually worship Jesus. Three types of people. And I am here to tell you, not only has church history, not well, not only has history as a whole been characterized by these three types of people, wise men and fools, there are those three types of people in this room today. There are wise men and fools today in this auditorium. I also want to remind you that when we talk about these three different types of people, who are they? Wise men and fools. When we talk about them, I want you to remember that ultimately it's a heart issue, isn't it? It's always a heart issue. We, we understand that there is something in the human heart that is keeping us from being the people that we want to be, that we ought to be, that we should be. Our world, our world is full of a lack of compassion, a lack of love. Our world is full of people who are constantly wanting to put themselves first. It's a heart issue. There are people who are hostile to Jesus. There are people to, who are indifferent to Jesus. And it's a, it's a heart issue. So when we think about these three types of people today, I don't want you to think about something that happened thousands of years ago. I want you to examine your own heart. I told you we're going to study three types of people. The first one, if you're keeping notes, is those who are hostile to Jesus. That's the very first thing that we see here in the text. In the story, King Herod is hostile to Jesus. This king, this ruler is actively seeking to get rid of Jesus. Why? Because Herod believes that the child who is born, who is king of the Jews, is a threat to his throne. As we read just a few moments ago, we see that the wise men are warned to go back a different way. Why? Because Herod was seeking to kill the Messiah. He wanted no rival for his throne. Make no mistake about it. When we look at this passage, Herod the king, isn't that funny? Herod the king is hostile toward the true king, the king of kings. Herod was a king who was appointed by the people. Jesus is the king sent by God himself. And we see here that Herod is hostile toward Jesus. Some of you may be thinking, well, wait a minute. Didn't Herod say, when you find him, tell me, so that I may come and worship him too? Oh, it was a trick, wasn't it? He didn't really want to come and worship Jesus. He wanted to kill Jesus. There are many people today. And no doubt, perhaps even people here today in this auditorium who when you honestly look into your heart, you are hostile toward Jesus. Why is that? Because Jesus is intimidating to your own personal power. At the end of the day, you don't want to have a Lord over your life. You don't want to be told what to do. You don't want to submit. You don't want to bow down to authority. You want to live your own life, doing your own thing, the way you've always done it. As a matter of fact, some perhaps would even rather that Jesus did not exist. There are all sorts of people out there in the world today who tell you why you shouldn't believe in Jesus? All you got to do is look at New York Times bestsellers. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, let us get rid of Jesus. Let us pretend like He's not even real. I want you to understand this morning that when we look at this passage, it may be, we may be thinking to be hostile to Jesus is wanting to kill Jesus, 
But I would say to you, being hostile to Jesus is acting like he doesn't exist. Pretending like he's not even real. There is a hostility to Jesus, not only in this day, thousands of years ago, not only throughout the history of of mankind, but there is hostility towards Christ today in our world, and there is hostility toward Christ in the church. Why? Because it's a heart issue. Mankind, apart from Christ, is lost. Dead in sin, depraved by nature. What is what did Paul say in the book of Romans, chapter three? They've gone their own way. There's none who seek after God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Their op- their their throats are an are an open grave. They're dead in the inside. Oh, they don't want to listen to a sermon. They don't want to listen to the preacher preach. They would prefer that Jesus didn't even exist. You say, well, pastor, how could there be people like that in the church? It could be a husband drug here by his wife. It could be a wife drug here by her husband. It could be a teenager drug here by his parents. Hostility toward Jesus. I witnessed to a lost man just a few days, well, I say a few days ago, I guess it wasn't. I've been, I don't even, for three weeks now, I haven't even known what day of the week it is. Except on Sunday, praise the Lord. I was watching online. But I guess it's been a, a month or so ago, I witnessed to a lost man. I didn't know him. Just thought I'd share the gospel with him. When I begin to ask him about his, is he a spiritual person? Does he, does, he, does, does he know where he's going to go when he died? He said to me, I don't believe in all that. Bleepity bleep bleep. That's what he said. I don't believe in all that. As he was kind of walking away from me. I don't believe in all that. And he said a word. And I said, well, friend. I said, one day you will. Because one day you're going to stand before him and you're going to give an account. And he walked off. I use that illustration to tell you that there are people out there in our world today who are hostile toward Jesus. And there will be some today who perhaps watch this message through live stream or will watch this message at some point throughout throughout history. It's out there. It's on on the web. And, And I would say that if you are hostile toward Jesus, listen to me, you're a fool. You are an absolute Full. Secondly, we see that there are those who are indifferent to Jesus. Indifferent. And boy, I'm telling you something. This is where we this. This is not only talking about lost people. This talks about. I think those who are hostile to Jesus. That's 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 talking about people who are lost. You know what I'm saying? But when you talk about people being indifferent, it's not just lost people. It's religious people. It's Christian people. And I make a distinction between those who are religious and those who are truly Christian. You can be very religious and not be saved. But if you're a Christian, you're saved. Look here what I'm talking about. We read our passage again. And the Bible says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. And when, king, and when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Now notice here, verse 4. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, That's the religious people, isn't it? 
And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born, where the Messiah was to be born. And notice what the religious teachers say, verse 5. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And then they quote here from the Old Testament, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. O you Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. But they didn't follow the wise men, did they? They did not go and look for the Messiah. They knew where he was to be born. They quoted the scripture. They knew where to find the scripture. They knew the book, the chapter, and the verse. But they were indifferent. The Magi come seeking Jesus. They desire Jesus. They desire to worship Jesus. They sought Jesus. And the scribes and the chief priest didn't even want to go. Well, I could preach on that. Talking about Christians that don't want to go to church. Come on now. Huh? Oh, you don't have to go to church to worship Jesus, they'll tell you. I'm going to tell you something. You don't worship Jesus if you don't fellowship with His church. Because the church is the bride of Christ. And if you shun His bride, He shuns you. Chew on that. Nobody wants to be called a fool today. I tell you, if you get up and walk out during this sermon, you've just proved to the whole church you're a fool. There are people here today, even in this service, who are indifferent to Jesus. I'm not saying you're lost. You could be. You may very well be saved. But you've allowed yourself to become indifferent. Now it's interesting that in the account, the people who were most indifferent to Jesus were those who were most religious. Boy, they knew the scriptures. They knew where he was to be born. They heard that he was born. And they say, we know that the scriptures say, but we actually don't want to meet with Jesus. We know what the scripture teaches. But we don't want to meet him. We don't want to spend time with him. We really don't want to get to know him. They treat Christianity as if it's a religion rather than a relationship. They think to themselves, as long as I obey God, therefore God accepts me. As long as, I, as long as I do certain things, God accepts me. So now I do all these things, and God is indebted to bless me. That's religion. That's not salvation. But what does the gospel say? What does the gospel teach? The Bible says, I obey, or the religion says, I obey, therefore God accepts me. But the gospel says, I am accepted because I am accepted by grace through faith. Therefore, I respond by obeying God. You want to know whether or not you're indifferent to Jesus? Get ready. It's going to sting. But I I make it sting because I love you. Are you ready for it? You want to know whether you're indifferent to Jesus? How much time do you spend in this word? I'm I'm saying it to help you. You know it's right. Don't you? You know it's right. And it hurts. It stings. But I wound you in order to bind you up and help you. If you don't spend time in His Word, praying to Him, talking to Him, seeking Him, getting to know Him, listen, beloved, then you have been indifferent to Jesus. 
Oh, you're not hostile. I get that. You're not hostile. But if you're honest, you've been indifferent. Why? It's a heart issue, isn't it? Somewhere along the way, you've forsaken your first love. And you've allowed other things to creep in. That's why you haven't been experiencing the joy of the Lord like you should. That's why your prayers feel like they are... uh, I mean, when's the last time that, that you think about it, that God has actually like heard your prayer and answered it? Right? I believe that indifference to Jesus is one of the epidemics in the American church. I don't think it's a pandemic because there are brothers and sisters all over the world who are being persecuted. And they are meeting in house churches, underground churches, under, the, under candlelight, just to read the Bible. Risking their own lives just to gather together. They are gathering together in persecuted countries under candlelight so that they don't draw any attention to themselves. Singing very softly, very low, and reading the scriptures. Huddled together, but they're gathered together at the risk of their own life. Oh, they are worshipers of Jesus. They are wise men. But the fools are hostile and indifferent. Imagine that you had a life-threatening illness. Let's pretend that you needed a heart transplant. And somebody came to you and said, I'm willing to give up my life so that you can receive my heart. Would you be indifferent towards that person? Would you? No. Your heart would overflow with gratitude. You would want to get to know that person. You would want to spend time with that person. And listen, Christ gave His life that we might be saved. You know, one of my greatest, one of my greatest frustrations, one of the greatest things that breaks my heart are people who I have led to the Lord, baptized, but then go on to live their life like they just don't care. Do you know why that bothers me? Because every person I share the gospel with, I make them count the cost. I said, you understand what this means? This means that you are forsaking living life for yourself. You're turning away from your sin. This means that you're going to follow Christ. You're going to worship together with the body of Christ. You're going to be a part, active member of this church. And we're going to serve the Lord together and grow together. Right? You understand that, right? Yes, yes. This is what you want for your life, right? Yes, yes. Well, praise the Lord. They baptize and, you don't, and, and then you have to call them and say, Where have you been? Why haven't you been to church? Where have you gone? Oh, we say, oh, it's the pandemic. Listen, I'm talking about before the pandemic even came on the scene. And these will be the same people who are gone after the pandemic's gone. I just don't understand it. I don't get it. How could we be indifferent? Who are the fools? Those who are hostile to Jesus and those who are indifferent to Jesus. What does the Bible say about fools? Listen to these verses. Proverbs 18, verse 2. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only expressing his opinion. You don't don't want to hear the word. You don't want to be told what the word of God says or what Jesus wants. He just wants to trust in his own opinion. 
Proverbs 29, 11. A fool gives full vent to his spirit. Full vent. But a wise man quietly holds it back. Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Look here. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. I see that all the time. I've seen in 20 years of pastoral ministry, I've seen people get offended and get up and walk out. Never to see them again. All just because the pastor's preaching the word. And then they leave and what do they say? Well, that pastor said, listen, I'm an expository preacher. You know what that means? I preach verse by verse from the Bible. And the points that I make come from the scripture. I try to stay away from sarcasm because there's no really no place for that in the pulpit. Notice I said try. I try to stay away from venturing off and getting caught up in emotion and saying something that God didn't lay on my heart to say. I try. I try to speak what God wants me to speak and that's why I stay with the scripture. Because if I get away from it, I'll say something that I shouldn't have said. And then it offends somebody. And if that's the case, I need to apologize. But if it's me preaching the scripture, don't say I said it when God said it. And you know good and well, if you are hostile towards Jesus, or if you're indifferent to Jesus, you know good and well, deep in your heart, you know you're a fool. You know it. Proverbs 18.6 A fool's lips walk into a fight, and his mouth invites a beating. Proverbs 29, 9. If a wise man has an argument with a fool, the fool only rages and laughs, and there is no quiet. And then there are those, beloved, who worship Jesus. Who are they in this passage? They are the wise men. The Bible says there in verse 7, When Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared and sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child like they needed to be told that. They were already doing that. And when you have found him, bring him to bring the word that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way and behold the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest to the place where the child was. Look here, look at these worshipers, look at these wise men. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, the Bible says. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they fell down. And what did they do? They worshipped him. They fell down, beloved, and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Gifts that are worthy of a prophet, a priest, and a king. And then God warned them not to go back the way they came. And so they departed another way you see we've talked about the fools those who are hostile and those who are indifferent but now we look at the wise men and who are they listen ladies it's wise men and wise women and who are they those who worship Jesus they're seeking after him they won't stop until they find him and when they find Jesus They lavish gifts upon Jesus. I ask you today, where do you find yourself? Are you hostile? Are you indifferent? Or have you come to be a true worshiper of Jesus? Do you seek Him? Do you long to know Him? Do you bow down before Him? There are very few, very few, Very few worshipers of Jesus today. But my prayer is that you will be a faithful worshiper 
of Christ our King. That you would prove yourself to be a wise person and not a fool. Uh, as I was down, I was reading through the biography of Charles Simeon. He's a, a man who was saved during the 1700s, started pastoring Holy Trinity Church in Cambridge towards the end of the 1700s. He had little experience when he came to pastor the church. All many great pastors had been there before him. It wasn't a situation where the church called the pastor. It was one of those situations. It was an Anglican, Anglican church, so he was appointed by the bishop. But during that time, they had an interim lecturer. So you had a pastor, and then you had your lecturer. Now, Charles Simeon was a preacher, and God had used him mighty. And one of the reasons that Charles Simeon is so, so precious to expository preachers is because he is one of the first who began to preach verse by verse through books of the Bible. Which I believe is the only biblical way of handling God's Word. That's the way He gave it to us, right? He didn't give us a topical Bible. What did He do? He gave us books of the Bible. When Charles Simeon arrived at his church, the church was mad because they wanted the interim lecturer to actually be their pastor. Back then, they would have pews that you would buy in the Anglican church. You had to buy your pew. So, of course, the rich came first. They purchased their pews. And if you were poor, you had to sit in benches in the back. When they found out that Simeon would be their pastor, which meant that he would preach eventually, and on those days when they knew he was preaching, they would lock their pews so nobody could sit in it and they would not come to church. How would you like that? The first Sunday that he was there, they locked their pews. They put locks on their pews and they didn't show up. I'm talking about people who claim to be Christians. They thought they were making a stand, that they were proving a point. What they didn't realize is they were being hostile to Jesus. In their religiosity, they proved themselves to be nothing more than fools. Indifferent. Charles Simeon said, okay, I'll, I'll preach on Sunday nights and let the, let the poor come and let them... When they found out Charles was going to do that, you know what they did? They, put a, they locked the doors where he couldn't get in. Oh, it hurt. It hurt Charles Simeon. It did. Oh, how he loved the pre people. And he loved preaching, but even more than that, he loved ministering to the poor. A godly man. But he stayed the course. He was a worshiper of Jesus. He sought the Lord. He studied the Word. He was a prayerful man. And eventually, over time, he gained favor with the people because they saw his true character. All oh, some left, made no mistake about it. But he ended up pastoring that church. It was his only church. Pastored for 50, 50 plus years as their pastor. I think in that story, you hear about those who are hostile to Jesus. You even hear about those who are indifferent to Jesus. But did you see in Charles Simeon, a man who is a true worshiper of Jesus? And I pray that you are. I pray you're not a fool. Like Herod, who is hostile, or like the scribes and the chief priests who were indifferent. 
I pray that you'll be like the wise men. That you'll bow down before him every day of your life. That you'll bring him gifts. That you'll honor his church. That you'll praise his name. And you'll spread his gospel. Let me conclude with application. One of the things I've taught my son and others, I've taught Ashton, I've taught Austin. If you haven't applied the sermon, you haven't preached it yet. The sermon is not complete until there's application. So if you are hostile to Jesus, would you call me this week and let's talk? Would you do that? Just call me. Let's just sit down, have a cup of coffee, water, whatever it is, and let's just talk about that. I'll listen to you. You can call the church office. You can call my secretary. Uh, I think she's gone this week, so just call the front office at the church. Just call the church. And they'll let me know, and I'll call you back, and we'll set up an appointment, and you just come in. And let's talk about it. I want to listen to you. Many people are hostile toward Jesus because they're hurting. Perhaps something's happened in their life and they're hurting. I want to hear you. I want to listen to you. You come, let's talk. If you are indifferent to Jesus, would you repent and return to your first love? Would you acknowledge that? Repent and return to your first love. Listen, beloved, I'm not just, I'm not just saying this to, to be a braggart. I don't, please understand my heart. I want to set the example. I can't imagine one day going by and not spending time in God's Word. I can't imagine it. I need Him every day. And I want Him to know that. I want to bring him the gifts of my sacrifice and praise and thanksgiving. And thirdly, if you are a worshiper, a wise man, would you stay steadfast and immovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord? Father, this morning we praise you We thank you for your word. We thank you for this message that you have given us. And Lord, I pray for those who perhaps are listening to this sermon, watching it through live stream, and those who are here who are honest and they would say that I am hostile towards Jesus. God, let them know that there's someone willing to listen. And Lord, I pray for them. I pray that they would behold the beauty of Christ, the grace of God, and the comforting of the Holy Spirit. That they would see that their greatest need is salvation. That they would learn that their heart can be changed. Their vision of God can be changed. If they'll trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And then, Father, I pray for the indifference that seems to characterize so many churches today. Oh God, bring us to repentance. I pray that we would return to our first love and that you would bless Edmonds First Baptist Church with true revival. And then Lord, for the wise men and women, oh God, I thank you for them. I pray that they would remain steadfast and immovable always abounding in the work of the Lord. For that is the only work that's not in vain. And beloved, if you desire salvation today, I'll be standing right down front. I may be sitting, but I'll be right down here. You come to me. and We'll go to the altar and pray together. I'll put a mask on, whatever. We'll go to the altar and pray. And this morning, right here, you can give your life to Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You come and see me.
Father, we thank you. We praise you. May your word not return void, and I believe that it won't, because you promised it wouldn't. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.